Okay, good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Vanessa Soto and I'm with the Office of Public Participation. I wanna thank you for joining us today for the State Water Resources Control Board's Safe and Affordable Fund for Equity and Resilience, better known as SAFER. Uh, the program's risk assessment webinar on thresholds, weighting and scoring part four, hosted by the Department of Drinking Water and moderated by the Office of Public Participation. This webinar is being held 100% virtually and is also being webcast publicly in English. We are also recording today's event and we'll make sure it is accessible for our attendees and anyone who may not uh, have been able to join us today. On the current slide is the Water Board's mission. Uh, collectively, we achieve our mission through an array of programs established within our divisions and regions. So the Water Board's mission is to preserve, enhance, and restore the quality of California's drinking water resources and drinking water for the protection of the environment, public health, and all beneficial uses, and to ensure proper water resource allocation and efficient use for the benefit of present and future generations. As it's the board's mission to preserve, enhance, and restore California's water resources for the benefit of present and future generations, we want to begin this meeting by acknowledging the groups who have and continue to experience economic, environmental, and social disadvantages as a result of historical marginalization and whose daily lives are impacted by racism and injustices. As a reminder, our work here today works to strengthen and empower Indigenous and community voices as we work together to provide clean, safe, affordable water to all Californians. So I wanted to take a brief moment to provide a quick overview of, safe, of the Safer Drinking Water Program. Safer stands for the Safe and Affordable Funding for Equity and Resilience. The SAFER program's overarching goal is to provide safe and affordable drinking water in every California community, co excuse me, community for every Californian. So the SAFER program is a term coined after the passing of Senate Bill 200 last year in July. Uh, it formalizes work which the Water Boards has already been doing for a long time. The creation of the new Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund is intended to fill funding gaps that, uh, that were present in the pre-existing program and allocates up to $130 million per year for 10 years towards drinking water projects, primarily in small disadvantaged communities. At the water boards, the SAFER program is primarily implemented by the Dr Division of Drinking Water, the Division of Financial Assistance, and the Office of Public Participation. DDW primarily works with drinking water systems, uh, while DFA is uh, primarily funding short and long-term solutions. And public participation usually uh, engages with communities uh, served by those systems along um, along the way. So there is also a safer advisory group that was formed with 19 members representing various parts of the stakeholder community. The safer advisory group was formed late last year to bring their local expertise to the table and to prov to advise um, on the program specifically for each annual fund expenditure plan. We'll move on to our presentation outline. Uh, so let's see what we'll cover today. Uh, you'll be hearing primarily from Kristen Abhold with the Drink Division of Drinking Water's Needs Analysis Unit. She'll cover the following with opportunities for feedback along the way. So first we'll head into an overview of the needs assessment. Uh, then we will cover a risk assessment 2.0 development. Next, proposed expanded uh, human right to water criteria. Then the proposed risk indicator threshold and scores, followed by proposed risk indicator and category weights. Next, we will uh, risk 
we will cover risk assessment options and recommendations, and finally uh, go over next steps and timeline. So really quick, uh, just some meeting guidelines and housekeeping. We want to thank each of you for finding a way to join us virtually today. We thank you for your patience and understanding as we quickly moved to a 100% virtual meeting space so that we can adapt to the current public health concerns. We are doing our best to make sure that everyone can participate in an effective way and that this time is valuable for you. Um, we don't expect any delays, but ask for your patience in advance should any difficulties arise. So some guidelines for our meeting are during today's event, uh, today, attendees will be able to submit questions through Zoom's Q&A feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. These questions will be read by the host and answered by the panelists. Also, if you find that someone else might have entered a question that you too would like answered, you can upvote the question by giving the question a thumbs up. And questions are then organized based on number of upvotes. Alrighty, uh, really quickly, uh, just a few more guidelines. Today's event will have poll questions, discussion topics, and the opportunity to ask questions and provide comments. If at the end of today's presentation during the open Q&A period you'd like to speak, please remember to raise your virtual hand. This will help us locate you in the attendee list. If called upon, you will be asked to unmute yourself to speak. I understand that some of our attendees are joining us via phone. As a reminder, if you are calling into today's event, please remember to raise your hand by pressing star nine on your telephone keypad. If you are called upon, press star six to unmute yourself. Once you have finished asking your question or providing comment, you can press star nine once more to lower your hand. In addition, this event is being live webcasted on the Cal EPA website found at video.calepa.ca.gov. If you are watching this webinar through the webcast only and would like to ask a question or share a comment, you can email safer at waterboards .ca.gov. We have someone monitoring the email and we'll try our best to ensure that your question or comment is heard. And finally, for technical assistance during the meeting, please email that same e email address at safer at waterboards.ca.gov. All right, now I'd like to introduce Kristen, your host for this morning's webinar. Kristen, the floor is yours. Thanks, Vanessa. I really appreciate that introduction. Um, and welcome, everybody. Happy Monday. Um, I'm sure you're all uh, sipping on your coffee and trying to get ready for the week. And I really appreciate you joining us today um, to start dag uh, diving into some really heavy topics <laughs> around our risk assessment. We're going to be sharing a lot of data, a lot of graphs and information with you today. And I hope that um, the way that we've structured this presentation uh, will help make things less confusing, um, but please feel free to ask us questions. Use that comment feature if you're participating via Zoom. Um, we want to make sure that we're able to uh, explain things clearly and address any questions or comments that you have. All right, let's get started. Um, so again, uh, Vanessa shared with you ways to participate and, and I apologize, the slide should have been uh, up one, one spot. Um, but again, we really encourage you to participate with us today. I'm going to get started with a poll question for those of you who have um, uh, participated that should look familiar to you. We're just trying to get a sense of, you know, have you participated in any of our previous webinars? This is the fourth webinar in a series of web webinars that we've hosted over um, this year. And it's good to know if folks are joining us for the first time um, or if they are repeat and they've been part of this process. So I'm going to leave this open for a little bit. And I want to encourage um, anybody who is uh, participating in this webinar via the EPA uh, webcast, you can answer any of the poll questions uh, and discussion topics using this bit.ly link on the screen here. I'll give you a little bit of time to write that down if you're interested. Um, it will take you to a web form online where you can respond to poll questions and our uh, discussion questions so you can participate. All right, I'm going to end the poll and oops, share 
results. And it looks like the vast majority of you joining us today have participated in our previous webinar workshops on the risk assessment. So thank you again for joining us. We're really happy to have you back and continue this conversation um, as we develop the risk assessment. One more poll question to get us started. Um, have you read the white paper, recommendations for risk assessment 2.0, threshold scores and weight system? We published a white paper last week. And let me share the new poll. Um, I'm assuming a lot of you have not had an opportunity yet to read it, and that is okay. You do not need to have read that paper to follow along and participate in today's webinar. Um, but I do hope that you take the time to skim through it. It's a lot of really great information in there. All right. It looks like uh, most of you have not had an opportunity to read it, 59%, and that is okay. Um, but we do have a few folks who have read the whole thing or have skimmed through it, which is awesome. Uh, thanks for doing that on such short notice. Again, we're going to be sharing with you a lot of details that are in that white paper, but I do encourage you to take a look at it if you want to learn more. Okay. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, I just want to repeat what Vanessa said at the beginning. Um, why are we here today? And that's because Senate Bill 200 uh, created a, a new funding source for the State Water Board called the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund. Um, it's the reason why SAFER program exists. And what's important about this fund, this new pot of, of funding available to us, is that it, um, it requires that the Water Board puts out an annual fund expenditure plan every year that prioritizes how that funding is spent. And SB 200, Senate Bill 200, requires that the, that the state use something called the needs assessment to inform the prioritization of projects and systems for funding. So what is the needs assessment? Um, the needs assessment has three core components. It has an affordability assessment, uh, that we conduct annually for DAC systems. We are supposed to conduct a risk assessment every year, which is what this webinar is about. Um, and then we do a cost assessment. And that cost assessment looks at all of our human right to water systems, our systems that are currently out of compliance or consistently failing, and our at-risk public water systems, state small systems, and domestic wells, and estimates how much it would cost to provide solutions to those communities. Um, it helps us conduct a, what we call a gap analysis of how much funding do we have available and how much do we really need in order to uh, bring solutions to these communities. It helps with our budgetary planning purposes. And for those of you who have been following along closely, um, you may have participated in some of our webinars that we've done on the cost assessment methodology. Um, we are in the process of developing uh, that approach. And there are white papers and webinar recordings on our SAFER website uh, where you can learn more. But again, today's conversation really is about this middle, this middle assessment, the risk assessment. And I want to emphasize, since we are starting to dig into data here, is that the risk assessment for public water systems, which is what we're developing, is focused on water systems with 3,300 service connections or less and schools K through 12. So make sure you have that lens on when we're walking through uh, what we're proposing here in this PowerPoint. So again, the purpose of the, the risk assessment, uh, the needs assessment, is to help us with prioritizing systems for funding and technical assistance within the SAFER program. Um, this pyramid really just helps illustrate that our top priority at the Water Board are those systems that are currently out of compliance or consistently failing, and that's our human right to water systems. So the, we have a map on our website of which systems those are, and that's updated on a quarterly basis. Um, but the risk assessment is focused on those, those two middle tiers there, our at-risk water systems and domestic wells, and our potentially at-risk systems. Again, helping us figure out how to prioritize our funding. And just another visualization on how it all flows together. Um, we have our annual needs assessment. Again, all three of those components help inform the Division of Financial Assistance fund expended, annual fund expenditure plan, which helps with our prioritization, which helps us then target our technical assistance 
uh, and funding activities. We have two engagement uh, units, the no Northern and Southern engagement unit that help connect systems um, and work with them to identify the best long-term solutions for those communities. So what are, what are the big components of a risk assessment? Of, again, most of you have been following along, but for the, the new folks with us today, um, our risk assessment methodology for public water system is composed of three key pieces of, of data or information. The first are risk indicators. These are our quantifiable, measurable pieces of data that help us assess uh, water system performance. Uh, we then have thresholds, which is how we determine if a system is performing well or if it's not. And then we have weights and scores, which help us uh, combine our, our uh, different risk indicators together to help us figure out, well, who's most at risk? And we're finally focused today on, on the last two, thresholds, weights, and scores. We've hosted three webinar workshops um, over the last few months to really dig into to how we develop our risk assessment methodology. And for those of you who've been following along, you've been with us through step one and step two here of our development process. And we've over the last few weeks been working on thresholds and scoring and weighting steps four and five here. So just to recap for everyone, you know, we started out at the beginning of the year with uh, we have a contract with UCLA and a number of subcontractors where we were developing our first risk assessment and we call that risk assessment 1.0. Um, the scope of that contract was developed before uh, SB 200 and the safer program um, was in existence. And we had a, you know, this list of original risk indicators. We we published this um, list and in some initial uh, aggregated um, data assessments. And the public feedback and our our, you know, recognition was, you know, we we probably can do better. We want to align uh, the risk assessment more closely with the goals of SB 200 and the human right to water. And so we've gone through this this journey with all of you. Um, three webinar workshops, like I've said, really trying to maybe come up with a, a, a more comprehensive list of risk indicators. One of the, the big pieces of, of public feedback that we got in the very beginning was we should include risk indicators that more closely align with technical, managerial, and financial capacity of water systems. So we added that fourth category there on the right of different uh, risk indicators that we should be looking at. Again, if you have not looked at our, our previous webinar recordings or, or white papers or PowerPoint presentations, I really encourage you to, to check out our website if you want to follow along on, on how we've developed um, the risk assessment to where we are today. So over the last few webinars, we've really narrowed things down quite a bit. Um, we had originally identified 129 potential risk indicators uh, that we could consider for our, our risk assessment. And we went through a very extensive review process uh, to narrow down that 129 risk indicators down to 22 recommended risk indicators. And we shared that with everybody um, a few uh, months ago in October. And we solicited feedback from the public, from stakeholders uh, to help us figure out, is this the best list? And we, we got some great feedback and, and we refined things um, a bit. But I just wanted to share with all of you, you know, our final list of 22 indicators. And I really want to highlight that there are a few in here, especially in the affordability bucket, um, that aren't going to be incorporated into this version of the risk assessment for the, the next fund expenditure plan. We want to work through a stakeholder driven process to really identify the best way to incorporate these affordability risk indicators, both into the risk assessment and affordability assessment. So I hope you continue to engage with us over the next year as we dig into those particular uh, indicators. So what have we done since October 13th? Uh, we have uh, incorporated both pr public and internal recommendations to finalize our risk of our list of risk indicators for risk assessment 2.0. We developed and pro uh, proposed expanded criteria for the human right to water list, and I'll dive into that shortly. We identified potential threshold scoring and weighting approaches for our risk indicators, and we've proposed an aggregated risk assessment uh, methodology option with proposed uh, at-risk and potentially at-risk thresholds. And all of that is detailed in our white paper, which again, I encourage you to check out when you've got the time. So before we dig in to the risk assessment, it's really important that we step back 
and take a look at some of the risk indicators we were we proposed back in October. Um, we we received some feedback both internally and externally that you know our risk indicator list included uh, violation data and four violation um, data points in particular. We had presence of E. coli violations, treatment technique violations, operator certification violations, and monitoring reporting violations. And the question that was posed to us was, well, you know, if you have systems that have these types of violations, um, you know, shouldn't they be failing? Why are we considering them at risk? Um, and that, that made us really uh, stand back a little bit and, and, and question, okay, well, what, what do we really mean if a water system is consistently failing? What does that mean for a system to be at risk? And so we looked at our regs, I think, which is a good starting point for the water board. Um, and in particular, we looked at what it means for, for us to be meeting primary drinking water standards. You know, the human right to water is making sure that primary drinking water standards are being met for all systems. And which is why we, we dug in here. And so let's take a look at, at what the code says for primary drinking water standards. Um, you know, maximum levels of contam contaminants have an adverse effect on folks, so we definitely want to avoid that. Um, we specific treatment techniques are adopted by the state in, in lieu of maximum contaminant levels. And another standard is that monitoring reporting requirements are met. Um, and so we used this list here to again evaluate the list of the four risk indicators that we had proposed um, for violations. And we've now uh, ex we're expanding our criteria for the human right to water list and we're, we'd appreciate your feedback on our recommendations here. You can see that previously, um, so before March 2021, this was the criteria that we had for the human right to water list. It was mostly based off of whether or not a system has a primary or secondary MCL violation with an open enforcement action. That's going to continue to be part of our, our human right to water criteria. Um, but we are expanding it to include systems that have an E. coli violation with an open enforcement action, those that have treatment technique violations in lieu of an MCL. And that, you know, that's really important. So not all of our treatment technique violation codes would be utilized for this criteria. And I encourage you to take a look at Appendix C of our white paper, which provides the full list of treatment technique violation codes or violation types that we would include as the expanded criteria here. Um, this one's important because it has two different uh, criteria thresholds. Um, the first is if you have a system that has one or more treatment technique violations, uh, again, in lieu of an MCL with an open enforcement action, then they would be on our human right to water list. Or, if you have a system that has had three or more treatment technique violations related to a primary contaminant within the last three years. So that system may have had three treatment technique violations that have been closed or re remedied, um, but if they still had those within the last three years, they would still be considered um, a system that's on our human right to water list because they are consistently failing. Um, now, after three years, if they have no longer accrued any additional treatment technique violations, they would then be removed from the human right to water list. Uh, and the last one here is monitoring and reporting violations. And these, again, it's only a subset of all of the monitoring and reporting violation types that the water board has. It's those that are related to an MCL um, and treatment techniques. Now, our criteria for this one is if you've had three monitoring reporting violations within the last three years, where at least one of those violations has been open for 15 months or longer, then you would be considered uh, a human right to water system and be added to our list. So pretty stringent criteria there. And again, we're really looking at those systems that are consistently failing. Um, so if you, we were to uh, adopt this expanded criteria, right now, looking at the systems that we have, we would probably be adding around 40 water systems to the, the current human right to water list. So I hope you were able to follow all of that. Again, you can learn a lot more in Appendix C of our published white paper. And I'm going to launch a poll, try to get some initial feedback 
on this. The question is, um, does the expanded criteria for the human right to water list align with the primary drinking water standard definitions for systems that are out of compliance or consistently failing? A few more seconds. Okay. All right. Uh, it looks like the majority of you, 62%, uh, need more time to consider the expanded criteria, which absolutely makes sense. Again, I really encourage you to check out Appendix C of our white paper. Um, but 36. Uh, percent say that they agree with the expanded criteria, which is great to hear. Uh, and then we've got 2% or actually one voter uh, who disagrees. And we really encourage those who disagree to speak up. We want to hear from you um, so we can understand uh, why the proposed criteria does not align with, um, with what your expectations are. And with that, we're going to move into uh, a discussion topic. So I encourage you to follow the instructions here if you have any thoughts. We're looking for feedback um, on our expanded human right to water criteria. Do you have any immediate feedback or thoughts that you'd like to share with us on what we've proposed here? Um, and especially around the definition of consistently failing. Uh, that, that's really what we were looking at when we were, um, we were proposing some of this criteria. So Vanessa, I'll turn it over to you. Do we have any questions or comments uh, to, to share? Thanks, Kristen. It doesn't look like we have any that have come in yet. And there are no raised hands. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like we have any yet, so. Okay. We'll give folks just another like 10 seconds. If you have a comment or a question, you can raise your hand if you're participating via Zoom or use the, the Q&A chat feature. And again, for those of you who are participating via the EPA webcast, um, you can email us at safer at waterboards.ca.gov, or you can even use the, the bit.ly link to our, our form online where you can type in your question there as well. All right, Vanessa, I don't see anything else. Should we move on? Yep, I think we're good to go. Oh, awesome. I'm sorry. Oh. So we just got one in just in the nick of time. And that's coming from Danielle Coates. I'm a little unclear about which entities these new criteria apply to. I heard that it is intended for systems with 3,300 connections. However, it is my understanding that the human right to water list has systems up to 10,000. Did I misunderstand or are there some inconsistencies? That is a great question. Um, so it, it's not limited to systems under 3,300 service connections. That is for uh, just the, uh, the at risk or risk assessment um, for the human right to water list. It's um, it's all community water systems and schools K through 12. So great question, Danielle. Appreciate that. Thanks, Kristen. We have one more. Uh, this is from Robert Bocock. Uh, I don't want to jump ahead, but is there a criteria for multiple contaminants? i.e. if a treatment technology solves multiple issues, is more credit given? Thank you, Robert. That's another great question. Um, so that's not part of our, our criteria for um, the human right to water, but that is something that we were trying to look into for the risk assessment. Um, at this time, we're not looking at um, uh, systems that are experiencing uh, issues from multiple contaminants. Uh, it's something that we'd like to, I think, 
expand into in the future. But we do look at systems that um, have extensive treatment installed, which may capture some of those systems that are dealing with multiple contaminants. And we can talk about that when we dive in a little bit more. So hopefully that answers your question. But if you have any thoughts or ideas, we definitely would appreciate them uh, shared with us either via email or, or you can raise your hand and talk us through it. Um, but we appreciate your participation. All right, any other questions? Uh, no. Thanks, Robert. I guess, oh, Vanessa, you know, one thing to mention um, for Robert is if a water system uh, is has exceeded an MCL for multiple contaminants, they would be on the human right to water list. So, um, but I'm assuming he's referring to our at-risk list. Okay, great. It doesn't look like okay. any more have come in and we have no raised hands at the moment. Great. Um, please feel free again to use that Q&A or email us if you have questions. We, we definitely have time to address them today. Okay. All right. So, you know, we just talked about the expanded, our proposed expanded criteria for the human right to water list. And that was really important for us to, uh, to try to figure out before we jumped into the next phase of our risk assessment methodology development, because there was that overlap of of metrics or indicators used for our risk assessment and our human right to water criteria. Um, so we used what we recommended there to help guide us in setting uh, recommended thresholds for those overlapping indicators. And I'll, I'll get into that right now. Um, so in determining risk indicator thresholds for our risk assessment, UCLA conducted extensive research to try to figure out, you know, is anyone else out there um, using thresholds for any of these indicators, these metrics that we're using for the risk assessment? And we did find a lot that we could draw on. We had a number of different types of thresholds that we were looking at. Some that were derived from legislative or regulatory definitions, others that are supported by empirical evidence, um, other thresholds that were maybe utilized by other California agencies or state governments or even the US EPA. Um, thresholds that are just broadly recognized by sector experience. You know, if you were to ask most of our district engineers or folks who've been working in the water sector, you know, they would say this threshold is definitely what we would expect you to be looking at here. And there were really only four indicators, risk indicators that did not have any sort of threshold that we could draw on. And I do want to point out that if you were to add up all these numbers, you would say, whoa, that's more than that's more than the risk indicators you looked at. And that's because there were multiple risk indicators that qualified across these different threshold types. When setting thresholds and scores, we also looked at the data. Um, we we uh, mapped out uh, how water systems, again, under 3,300 service connections are performing across these different indicators. Um, and we also overlaid that data um, with our current human right to water uh, list of systems and those that would be qualified under the expanded human right to water uh, list. And if you take a look at Appendix B in the white paper, you'll see that for all of our risk indicators, we've mapped out the data so you can see how systems are performing. And in some cases, and I think this was a good example, you know, there's some really clear steps, if you will, in the data, some clear breaks on where um, systems are performing. And you can he see here for a number of sources that a good chunk of our systems, 1300, uh, only have one source. And so these types of natural breakpoints in the data also helped inform us on where we were recommending our proposed risk indicator thresholds. We also needed to standardize or normalize our, our risk indicator thresholds with scores in order to do a risk assessment. And that's because a lot of the data that we're looking at is in different units or scales. Um, you know, some are, are measured in time, while others are measured in, um, in risk even, uh, if we look at the DWR uh, risk results. And so we needed to standardize everything with a, a scoring system. And so what we did, was we recommended a, a standardized score range between zero and one points for every uh, proposed threshold that we were looking at for each risk indicator. 
Now, the maximum number of thresholds uh, per indicator that we would consider was three, um, but the vast majority of the indicators that we have have about two thresholds. Here you can see one that included the, the maximum we would consider, which was three. Uh, threshold zero is really just to be super clear on what, you know, which systems would get zero, zero points or zero, you know, risk score um, for that indicator. Really, when you start getting to one and above, that's when you start to accrue um, points, if you will, risk points. Um, so for here, maximum duration of, of high potential exposure, if you've had one year, it's 0.25. If you've had two years of HPE, that's 0.5. And if you've had three or more years, that would be one. And one is, is the highest you could get um, for an individual risk indicator score. Another option that we had in looking at how we treat our individual risk indicators in our risk assessment was applying weight to those indicators. Um, we have the option of either treating every single risk indicator the same, that means they're all the same level of criticality, um, or we can apply different weights um, because we, you know, we recognize that some risk indicators may be more critical as they relate to a system's ability to stay in compliance. Now, we've hosted three webinars on developing our risk assessment methodology, and on two of those webinars, we've asked public feedback on which approach uh, the public uh, likes best, and both times, the majority of participants said that they thought that different weights should be applied to our risk indicators. So for our proposed methodology development here, we've looked at it both ways. Um, for weights, we chose weights between one and three for each individual risk indicator. Again, that is outlined in our white paper, but I'm also gonna walk you through them now. Um, so we have, again, uh, a number of risk indicators, and we went through um, assigned proposed thresholds, scores, and weights. So for E. coli presence, this one was a binary one. If you've had presence of E. coli in the last three years, you get a one. Uh, if you don't, it's a zero. And our proposed weight here is three. Um, increasing presence of water quality trends towards MCL. Uh, if you read the white paper, again, Appendix B, you'll see that um, the data here when we analyzed it didn't behave the way that we thought it would. And so we need to do a little bit more investigating to understand um, why this data uh, did not behave the way that we thought it would. So you can take a look at that, that paper. I'm not gonna dive in it, into it anymore here. Um, treatment technique violations here, again, another binary threshold. If you've had one or more treatment technique violations, you get a, a point of one or a score of one, and a, the proposed weight for that is one. Um, again, the treatment technique violations here, we look at all of the different treatment technique violation types, um, while the human right to water criteria is only looking at a subset. Um, so the criteria here is a little bit different. Um, for past presence on the human right to water list, if you've had one occurrence on the list, it's 0.5. If you've had two or more occurrences, it's a one, and we have a proposed weight of two. Um, we've already discussed the, the HPE, the max duration of high potential exposure, um, but we did propose a weight of three. Um, and then percentage of sources exceeding an MCL, if you're um, less than 50%, if you get zero points, but if it's greater than 50%, um, you get one point. Accessibility, for number of sources, you'll see that we have something called threshold X, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But for us, if you have zero sources, you are automatically at risk. Um, threshold zero, it's two or more sources, you're, um, you're doing okay, we're not gonna assign you any um, risk points, but if you only have one source, um, we did say uh, one point with a proposed weight of three. Absence of inner ties, this is another binary threshold where if you um, have zero inner ties, it is one point with a proposed weight of one. Water source types, this is looking at diversity of water sources. If you have two or more water source types, you have diversity, um, that's a zero. Um, there's no uh, risk score assigned. If you have one source and that one source is purchased, 
then it's a 0.5. So if you rely on purchased water, um, and then if you have a system that is has one source and it's only groundwater or surface water, then it is a one with a proposed weight of one. The DWR drought water shortage risk assessment results. Um, here, if you are below the top 25%, then you are um, you're doing okay. No, zero, it's a zero score. Top 25% is 0.25 points, and top 10% is a one with a proposed weight of two. And then if you're located in a critically overdrafted groundwater basin, uh, again, 75% of your water service area boundary is located in a basin, an over, overdrafted groundwater basin, and then it's one with a proposed weight of two. For affordability, um, we have three uh, risk indicators for this category that we are proposing using for, for the next fund expenditure plan. The first is percent of median household income. Uh, and these thresholds, a good, again, are a good example of a threshold where we have um, states, we have, including the Water Board, um, other agencies that have used these thresholds. Um, one and a half percent has been used by the State Water Board for making, um, to helping inform funding decisions. And that we put at 0.75 and two and a half percent, which has also been used um, by other agencies, uh, is a one. Extreme water bill, if, you, if your water bill is 150% uh, of that of the statewide average, 0.5, and then greater than 200% of the statewide average, it's a one. And percent shutoff, um, if you have 10% or less in the calendar year, it's zero, but if you have 10% or greater, that would be a one. And it's percent shutoff due to non-payment, um, which I, I wanna stress here. And you can see the proposed weights on the far right. The other proposed uh, risk indicators, again, these won't won't come into play until next year. We want to do a, a, a really a deep dive with our stakeholders in order to to best determine the appropriate thresholds and way to incorporate these indicators into both our affordability assessment and our risk assessment. So more to come on these. And then TMS capacity. These are all binary risk indicators. We have number of service connections. If you have 500 or less, you get a score of one and the proposed weight is one. Operator certification violations. If you've had one or more over the last five years, that's one point with a proposed weight of three. Monitoring and reporting violations. If you've had two or more over the last three years, that's a one with a proposed weight of two. Significant deficiencies. If you've had one or more over the last three years, uh, that's one point with a proposed weight of three. And if you have extensive treatment installed, uh, then that is a, a another binary, it's either yes or no. If you do, it's a one with a proposed weight of two. So I know that was a lot to go to go into, and I'm sure a lot of you probably are gonna wanna dig into our white paper a little bit more, but we are looking for some uh, initial feedback on our uh, recommendations for individual risk indicator thresholds, scores, and weights. Um, do you, uh, what do you think? Do the individual risk indicator thresholds and scores align with your expectations? I'll give you guys a few more seconds. And again, if you are participating via our uh, EPA webcast, you can use our bit.ly link to reply to these poll questions via a form. Or if you wanna change your response to these poll questions or you wanna sit on them and, and give us your feedback at a later time, um, you can also use that web form to do that as well. All right, ending the poll and share the results. 
So it looks like the majority of you uh, need a chance to review the threshold and score recommendations a little bit further, which totally makes sense. Uh, so appreciate your feedback there. A few of you um, I like, like what we've proposed here, which is great to hear. Um, there are some folks who think there needs to be some, some modifications made, about 25% of you, which is awesome. Please let us know what you, what you think. Um, if you have specific recommendations on how we should be modifying what we've proposed here, we definitely want to hear from you. Again, please, we have multiple ways that you can provide feedback uh, via our safer uh, email address or the form link that I keep pointing to. Um, or chime, um, please raise your hand or use the Q&A uh, at the end of this webinar to provide immediate feedback now. Okay, and then next. So we just went over how we can um, analyze uh, performance for individual risk indicators. Now, for those of you who've been following along with us, you know that our risk indicators kind of fall in the, into these four buckets. When we are conducting our risk assessment, we can also apply weight to these categories, these buckets, um, water accessibility, or I'm sorry, water quality, accessibility, affordability, and TMF capacity. Again, we have asked um, audiences twice now on two of our previous webinars whether or not we should be applying the same weight across all four of these categories or if we should have different weights for our categories. And both times um, our feedback was that we should be applying different weights to these categories because some of these categories, again, are more critical as they relate to a water system's ability to stay in compliance. And so what we did was we uh, applied weights between one and three to our risk indicator category so we could see what that looks like um, for our, our full risk assessment. So you can see here um, on the bottom, what we've done is we've proposed uh, three and three, the highest, um, the highest weights for water quality and accessibility. We did a weight of one for affordability and a lot of this, and you'll see later, um, a lot of this is because for our affordability indicator, um, we only have three risk indicators and two of those indicators rely on water rates data that we collect from our electronic annual report. That data has not been mandatory historically. And so we only have data for about 500 systems. And so if you're missing data, um, you're only you know, you only maybe have one indicator that you can be um, assessed for this category. So it's important for us to kind of down downweight this um, this category here for the risk assessment because of the lack of data and uniformity that we have for this for this category, at least for this next year. And then for TMS capacity, we are proposing um, a weight of two. Now. For those who like to kind of see the visual on how the map would work for an aggregated risk assessment, this is, and I hope you can read this, um, I'll walk you through it. This is, this is how the map works. Um, so at the very top, you see our, our categories. Um, what we do is we take the proposed, the score that a system has, that's what the S is, and we multiply that by the weight of the indicator. Now, if we weigh all of the indicators the same, the weights would all be one. And so, you know, you essentially are multiplying numbers by one. You're not, you're not doing anything. But if we do apply weights, you can see that the numbers would then jump up. And then we divide that score by the number of risk indicators per category. So for water quality, there's five indicators. We divide by five. And again, that helps normalize um, the indicators across the category so that we can compare what's happening in affordability to TMS capacity and accessibility. Um, if we apply weights in the categories, you'll see the next tier here, you take that score from the risk indicator category, and then we multiply that by the category weight, add those up and then divide by four for how many risk indicator categories there are. Um, again, normalizing the data um, and that would give us an aggregated risk assessment score that we could then assess. So how does this approach adjust to missing data? Um, we obviously, like I mentioned, we are missing data for systems 
especially in our affordability category because systems failed to report data that's necessary for the risk assessment. But in also in some cases, we have systems that just aren't going to have the data to report. Um, we do have systems um, as part of our, our inventory of systems that are under 3,300 service connections in schools that, you know, they don't charge for water. Um, and so we aren't going to have a rate um, data point. And so how do we adjust for that? And you can see here on the left hand side on the bottom that, you know, this is how it normally works when you've got um, all five data points, you divide by five. But on the right hand side, if we're missing a key data point, what we do is we omit it and then we divide by the number of indicators that we do have data for. So here it went from five down to four. And what we're doing is essentially redistributing the, the weights uh, and scores of the remaining indicators to make up what we're missing here. We use the same approach for categories. So if we have systems um, that really we just aren't going to, to apply the affordability category to, um, we will divide by three rather than four. Again, this is how we can adjust to missing data or where we need to omit um, certain systems from an entire category within the risk assessment. And so wanted to get your immediate feedback on that. Let's launch poll question number five. I appreciate your patience if I pull these up. Okay, do you like this approach for adjusting to missing risk indicator data? Just a few more seconds, I'm going to close this. Okay. And it looks like uh, the majority of you uh, like this approach. We've got 57%. 7% um, or three, three people say that they don't like this approach. Um, and 36% say that they need more time to consider this question before they can provide feedback. Um, which is great to hear. Again, please, please, please provide feedback. You can um, either participate today or use our bit.ly link for our form or email us. And I definitely want to hear from those who don't like this approach. If you have a recommendation on an, an alternative approach, we definitely would love to hear from you guys. Okay. Okay. So we've looked at how we can um, treat our individual risk indicators, um, how we apply thresholds, scores, and weights. We've looked at our options for applying weights to our categories. But the big question is, how do you determine if the system's at risk or not? You know, what approach do you take uh, to say if a system is is at risk or is not at risk? And we there are three approaches that we can uh, we could incorporate. So the first is you could have a system that is at risk due to their performance for one indicator or multiple. So if you have a system that performs one way or another um, for an individual indicator, it doesn't matter how, the, how they perform for any of the other indicators. They could all be you know, doing well, but because they did poorly in this one individual indicator, they're automatically at risk. That is an option. Um, a second option could be based on performance within an individual category. So perhaps uh, we have a water system that is performing well in TMS capacity, accessibility, and affordability, but they're performing very poorly uh, in the water quality category. We could develop a threshold there and make them at, automatically at risk because of poor performance within a category. Um, the third option is a combined risk assessment where we are assessing a water system's risk across all four of our categories. And we call that the combined assessment. Now you can utilize all three of these approaches. Um, it's not one or the other. You can have a, a more complicated assessment that has all of these included. But what we're proposing uh, for risk assessment 2.0 is utilizing options one and three. 
Here for option one, we are only proposing utilizing this approach for one of our risk indicators, and that's number of sources. So you might have recall, um, I pointed this out when we walked through all the individual indicators, but if we have a system that has zero sources, and we looked into all the systems that qualify for this, they're all reliant on hauled water. Um, for us, those systems are, are automatically at risk. Um, again, we only propose this for one of our risk indicators. Um, we are proposing option three as well, which is really relying on a combined assessment, looking across performance from all three, or I'm sorry, all four of our risk indicator categories. And we've developed three options for looking at a combined assessment uh, for determining at-risk systems. So let's walk through what those three options look like. Um, option one is no weight. We call this the raw data. So we don't apply any weight to the risk indicators and we don't apply any weight to the, the risk indicator category. Everything is treated equally. Option two uh, applies the weight to the individual risk indicators, but no weights are added to the categories, only the individual risk indicators. And option three, we include weights for both risk indicators and the categories. Again, this recommendation, um, option three, aligns with the feedback that we received from the public on our last two webinars where we asked if, if the folks um, preferred weighted indicators and, and categories, and both times we heard yes. So we wanted to look at how um, these three different options uh, performed. So let's dig in. So the first thing we looked at was performance within the categories. So if we're only looking at the category level, the only thing that we're looking at here is um, whether how the, the data changes when we apply risk individual risk indicator weights. Now you'll see on the left hand side, this is uh, the water quality indicators where no weights have been added to those uh, uh, individual indicators. On the right hand side, we've got the weights have been added. Options two and three, if we're only looking at this level of data, are the exact same. It's, we've added weights. Now, you'll see on the left hand side, uh, the axis on the on the left, the, the most points that you can have when you don't add any weights is one, right? Because we add up all the scores and then divide by five. So the max you could get would be one. When we apply the weights on the right hand side, the max number of points changes. Now we wanted to make the scales the same here so that it's really clear to see what's happening with the data. What we did was we overlaid the current human right to water list and the expanded human right to water list on these um, charts so that you can see how systems that are currently out of compliance or consistently failing um, are performing. And what we wanna look at as we compare these charts is how those colors are shifting. You know, and our expectation is that you want to see the color shift more to the right, the red and the yellow, um, indicating that uh, systems that are, you know, doing the worst are actually on our, our human right to water list. They are um, captured. And you can see when we add the risk indicator white uh, uh, weights here, that there is a subtle shift in the colors um, from uh, compared to option one and option two and three, moving to the right here. Accessibility. Again, on the left hand side, we have those that are, um, everything is weighted the same. And when we add the individual risk indicator weights, you see a, a subtle shift of our systems that are out of compliance more to the right. In affordability, again, no weights on the left and then weights on the right. And here, I really wanna point out, there's only 519 systems that we were able to assess for this category out of 20, 2,850. And then TMS capacity. No weights on the left, 
individual risk indicator weights on the right. Again, you see a subtle shift here. Okay. And so our question to you is, after looking at how individual risk indicator weights shift the data within the categories, um, do you still support having weights for individual risk indicators? Let me launch the poll. All right, end the poll, just a few more seconds. Okay. All right, it looks like the majority of you support the different weights, which is again, consistent with the feedback that we've received throughout this process. So it's just great to confirm that, especially after you see what the distribution of data looks like. Um, we do have folks about 35% who need more time, which totally makes sense. And then lastly, we do have three folks um, who don't like having uh, the different weights applied and would probably prefer the, the no weight approach. We definitely would like to hear from you to, to understand uh, your, your thinking there. So definitely please participate in our Q&A session at the end. Okay, so last we wanna show you what the aggregated results look like. And I think this is really exciting. So again, we're gonna walk through options one and three and show you what happens when we add everything up. Um, if you recall that slide where we showed you what the math looks like, this is what those results are gonna be. Um, using the proposed thresholds and scores um, and different weights that we've, we've walked through already. So here, option one, you'll see no, no weights for the uh, individual risk indicators and the categories. Option two here is with only individual risk indicator weights applied. The categories are all the same. And this is option three, where we've applied weights to both the indicators and the categories. Let's walk through this one more time so you can see how things have shifted. Again, what we're looking at here is how the, the current human right to water and expanded human right to water systems are are shifting. Option two and option three. Okay. So just based on what you saw there, <laughs> again, looking for some immediate feedback, you saw what happens when we add the category weights between two and three. Do you support different weights for risk indicator categories? Again, this is the third time we're asking the public this question, but you finally get to see how it impacts the data distribution. All right, I'm gonna close the poll. Just a few seconds. All right, it looks like again, the majority of folks um, continue to support the different weights approach for categories, which is, which is great to hear, it's great feedback. Although we do have a few folks um, who need more time, about 20%, which is again, totally reasonable, please let us know what you think. And then um, again, uh, three folks who do not like this approach. And again, we definitely want to hear from you. I also want to acknowledge all the folks that are sharing questions with us in the Q&A and our email and form. We are almost to the Q&A session where we will address all of these. So I appreciate your patience. Again, here's another way to look at the data for options one, two, and three, and you can see how the distribution uh, changes. 
as we apply different weights to the risk indicators and the categories. Do you have a, per, uh, a preferred method based on how you see the data currently? Just a few more seconds, then I'll close the poll. Okay. Uh, and here, 71% need more time to consider these options before providing feedback. Again, totally makes sense. We really hope to hear from you um, after this webinar. Um, we do have one person who likes option one with no weight. And then we do have 24% like option three. And then we have one person who doesn't like any of these options. And again, we really wanna hear from folks um, who don't like or um, any of the, the recommendations that we're proposing here today. Okay. So in order to, to keep things moving forward, um, the Water Board and UCLA and our partners, we, we do recommend option three for risk assessment 2.0. Um, and based on purely how the data is playing out, you can see when we apply the individual risk indicator weights and the category weights that it does um, shift our systems that are currently out of compliance and consistently failing further and further to the right. And to us, that's the type of behavior that we're looking for. And so for us, option three um, is what we'd like to propose. But again, this is not final. Um, we can make adjustments to the individual risk indicator uh, threshold scores and weights, um, but we can, you know, we, we want your feedback in order for us to consider what other options might look like. So please let us know if you have recommendations on how to adjust um, everything that we've presented on today, and that's in our white paper. And then we also wanted to put out there a proposed threshold for both potentially at risk and at risk systems. So we are recommending a threshold of 0.75 for our potentially at risk systems, which would be 584 systems that meet this criteria. And that is excluding those human right to water systems. Again, if, if we have a system that's on the human right to water list, they are not going to be on our at-risk list. They're already on that top tier of that priority pyramid, if you recall from the beginning of the presentation. And then we are proposing an at-risk threshold of one. Um, again, and this would be 702 systems, uh, excluding our human right to water systems or about 28% of the systems that we assess. Again, these uh, recommendations were determined based on clustering of where our human right to water systems were on these graphs. Um, again, nothing is final. This is just a recommendation uh, to, to keep things moving forward and to hopefully give you something to chew on to provide some feedback. And so last two poll questions, I swear, and then we'll get into discussion q and I'm really looking forward to, um, to digging into your questions. I know that we have a lot that's come in. So here we're asking, do you support the recommended methodology option of three? A few more seconds. Okay, end the poll, share the results. 
Um, it looks like 40% uh, support this recommendation for option three, um, again, which is where we are proposing um, weights for our individual risk indicator and weights for our categories. Um, we've got 10% think that they, the recommendations need minor changes, which is fantastic to hear. We'd love to hear what your thoughts are. And then the majority of you, though, 45% need more time to consider the recommendation here before providing feedback, which again makes total sense. And we look forward to hearing from you soon. And then we have two folks who don't support this recommendation. And again, we, we definitely want to hear from you. All right, last poll question. And this is, do you support uh, the recommended proposed potentially at risk and at risk thresholds here? Which again, we put at, at 0.75 and one. All right, slow this in just a second. Okay, um, again, majority of you need more time to consider uh, the recommendations here, which totally understand. Um, however, 43% uh, support the recommendations. 7% um, uh, need um, or recommend maybe some minor changes. And we have no, no voters um, who don't like these recommendations, which is great. It's fantastic to hear. Now, and I want to jump in because I'm assuming someone's going to ask me if it's not in the chart, uh, in the chat box already, but um, we have received a lot of questions um, during our risk assessment methodology of, you know, will we be sharing a list of water systems that are going to be potentially on our, our list here for at risk or potentially at risk before we release the fund expenditure plan um, next year. And what we're really trying to avoid here is putting out any sort of, um, you know, proposed list of systems. I think it could add a lot of confusion. We, we don't want to put a list out there um, that's going to shift and change based on the recommendations that people make for how we adjust our criteria because it could have a dramatic effect on the, the systems that are on the list. Um, and we don't think it, it's fair to those systems to put out a list. Um, so, and we also are trying to avoid bias. Um, we, we don't wanna have um, a list out here where, where folks are looking for a certain system to be either on and off the list and then to tailor our, our approach that we're doing statewide based on individual an individual system. So again, I hope you take that to heart um, and, and really think about that when, when we're talking about the proposed thresholds and scoring approaches. You know, this is meant to be statewide. So we'll we'll dive in. I think we're we'll talk about next steps. But I think it's I think we should just open Q and A because we have so many, um, and maybe we'll, we'll come back to these slides. So let me just get to to here. Um, so Vanessa, I'm going to turn it over to you. Moderate Q and A, and we'll um, we have a number of folks both within the Water Board who've been working on this, and we have UCLA. Um, available to answer specific questions. So, Vanessa. All right. Thanks, Kristen. All right. So, I want to thank you, Kristen, and our panelists for the thorough overview. Um, it's now time that we open it up for public comment or questions. And so, please remember that we do have the Q&A feature in, uh, in Zoom that I will be checking. And we also have the safer email where questions can be submitted. I do see that we received some questions via chat. And so those are in the queue as well. But uh, if you don't mind using the Q&A feature for any other questions that, that come up, we'd greatly appreciate that. Um, also, I encourage um, folks, I'll, I'll say your name once I ask the question. 
uh, for those of you who, who sent a question via chat or the QA feature. But I do encourage you to unmute yourself to expand on your question because it looks like some of these questions coming in might have been specific to a particular point in um, the presentation. So feel free to do that if your name is called and we are asking a question that you've submitted. Um, and then for, if you are joining on the phone, just really quick, uh, you can press star nine to raise your hand. And if you're called upon, um, you can press star six to unmute yourself. And the safer email uh, that you can submit questions to for those of us joining on the uh, Cali PA website is safer at waterboards.ca.gov. Alrighty, so yes, we do have a lot of questions queued up. Um, the first is from Cindy Tuck, and her question is, what if the system with the reporting violations is providing safe drinking water? Do you consider that to be consistently failing? And Cindy, go ahead. I see you have your hand raised. Go ahead and unmute yourself if you'd like to um, expand on that. Do we have Cindy on? Looks like she lowered her hand. So we can go ahead with her question. Do you, um, so Could you the, repeat it one more time uh -huh. for me, Vanessa? What if the system with the reporting violations is providing safe drinking water? Do you consider that to be consistently failing? I don't think I understand the first the first part of this is the 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 question. Systems that are 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 not providing safe water. Say that again. Yes. Um, it says, what if the system with the reporting violations is providing safe drinking water? Which systems that are receiving reporting violations are receiving are providing safe drinking water? I, I think the question is, okay, is around think, is Cindy if Cindy's available, she can jump in, but is around clarifying that a system could be considered consistently failing if it only had reporting violations but hasn't actually oh, incurred any yeah. So that just to elaborate yeah. on that point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. The the wording was a little odd for me. Um so yeah, you can have so again, the whole the expanded criteria for human right to water um is to capture those systems that are consistently failing and which is why we're looking at some of these broader violation types. And so you can have a system um, that is uh, has water quality that's being delivered that meets water quality standards, but um, they consistently are, you know, have monitoring or reporting violations or they have treatment technique um, violations or, or other, um, and for those systems that are kind of failing on the, the capacity side, that's the criteria that we have there. I'm not sure if Michelle um, yeah, Chris, wanted to add anything. I think because of the way some of the questions came in, obviously this was an earlier question. Cindy, I think what we're trying to get here is the fact that we don't know what the water quality is because they have open violations that are monitoring related to an MCL. So, you know, the, the action that they would need to take would be to resolve that, at very least resolve that open enforcement, make sure that they have collected all the samples and done the public notification of, of their monitoring reporting violation um, so that that would be resolved. And if that doesn't answer your question, Cindy, we're, we're happy to, to you know, take you off mute and let you uh, ask it yourself. Thank you. Sorry, Cindy, I see you have your hand raised. Do you want to unmute yourself and uh, clarify? Okay. 
Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Oh, great. Thank you for your patience on that. I appreciate you unmuting me. Um, I think this is something we'll, um, as Aqua and CMUA will want to review the uh, proposed expansion of the human right to water list. What I'd suggest in just an initial thought on it is you wouldn't want to be communicating to the public that a system is not providing safe drinking water if they are providing safe drinking water. And obviously the um, this gets into some detailed issues. So that's something we'll review, but that, you know, to date, when people look at that list, they know that there's an issue that they're not getting safe drinking water there. So I think we wanna look at that carefully. Thank you, Cindy. We, we really appreciate that feedback. And that's something we've been discussing internally too, is how to communicate um, what this expanded criteria means and, and, and what does our, um, you know, are we creating maybe another tier within our human right to water list in order to help us uh, communicate that. So we appreciate it. Great, thank you. Vanessa, thank yeah. you. All right. Uh, another question. To... Michael Claiborne is, with a question in the Q&A feature, is there a list of the systems that would be categorized as risk, as at risk and potentially at risk using the proposed threshold? Is It is hard to evaluate whether the thresholds are appropriate without knowing how specific systems would be categorized. I would just note also that this was raised early on. So this question, I mean, Michael can weigh in, but it may have been answered by the end of the presentation. Yeah, Michael, I don't know if you have an additional um, comment to make on this, but I did mention at the end, we don't anticipate sharing the list of systems um, that are, are meeting the proposed criteria here, mostly because, again, we don't want to put out um, a hypothetical list. Uh, it, I think would be pretty confusing and unfair to those systems. Uh, we want to refine the criteria. So if you have uh, different suggestions on different thresholds and scoring and weighting um, for our indicators, we would appreciate feedback there. Um, you can also, if you're familiar with, with a system, um, you can use the scoring uh, methodology that we've outlined here in the presentation on the white paper in order to determine whether or not a system would meet our criteria. Um, but we don't want to put out a, a list. Okay, thanks, Kristen. And so um, I'll go ahead and move on, but Michael, uh, if you would like to follow up, um, please go ahead and raise your hand and we will give you the option to unmute um, so that we can expand on your question if, if that did not answer. Um, okay, so moving on, um, this was also brought up earlier um, in the presentation. It's from an anonymous attendee, so I'm not sure who uh, who asked the question. Given recent changes in procedural requirements regarding shutoffs, some water agencies may be relying on liens rather than shutoffs for non-payment. Therefore, you may want to look at liens for non-payment. Yeah, we, we appreciate this comment. I think everyone knows, uh, you know, with the moratorium on shutoff uh, from the executive order that when we're looking at our risk assessment next year, which would be relying on our FY20 electronic annual report data for this data point, um, it's really not going to reflect uh, what it is we're trying to measure. So I anticipate that next year that percent shutoff will not be included in the risk assessment, although we will be adding some additional risk indicators to that affordability category for next year. Now, um, the idea of relying on liens rather than shutoffs, I think is an interesting idea. Um, I know that we don't uh, collect this data currently uh, through our electronic annual report. So we would need to figure out over the next few years, is that something that we wanna start collecting? Would that be a good um, potentially a better indicator um, for the for the risk assessment. So we encourage you to participate and to continue to provide suggestions like that. Um, and we'd want to hear from the rest of you too. This is a, an interesting idea. Um, if you like it, let us know because 
obviously our risk assessment is going to be evolving and changing over the years as we get better and better data as we refine um, our our approaches so great great ideas and i appreciate you bringing it up Okay, thanks, Kristen. So this one also came um, earlier in the in the presentation, and I do see your hand raised, Hasna Khan. So after we uh, get to the questions that are queued up, uh, we'll get to to your hand. Um, so this one comes from Bethany Rader, and again, Bethany, please go ahead and raise your hand if you'd like to expand on your question or clarify, and I'll go ahead um, and give you the functions um, to unmute. So what, so Bethany asks, what if any considerations are being made to accommodate funding needs for water systems facing affordability challenges until the board has determined the best way to include affordability into a system's risk score? Thanks, Bethany. Another, another great question. Um, you know, the, for, for DSA, the Division of Financial Assistance with their fund expenditure plan, they, they, use, they do use the results of our assessment um, to help guide prioritization. But when they are making funding decisions, um, you know, they are using a DAC data systems to help determine what type of um, funding assistance uh, can be provided. But it's really a system per system decision that's being made. Um, you know, I think DSA and the Water Board is still uh, exploring how best to utilize the results of the risk assessment and the affordability assessment um, in making decisions for uh, the funding side of SAFER. But it's still, there are still things that we're figuring out. I'm not sure if we have anyone from DSA online um, who would wanna provide any additional context there. Or Michelle, if you have anything you wanted to add. I just might add, yeah, that's a good question. We are still, you know, there is still a, a piece of the risk assessment that covers affordability and how that will be translated in is part of the fund expenditure plan outreach and um, their efforts there. So what I would be looking for if I was you is, is to sort of participate in um, their draft fund expenditure plan work, which would be out probably next spring um and to to sort of see um and participate and and provide feedback at that point on on how that should be utilized because we are we are looking at the drinking water side and then they are looking at how that translates into funding compared to all the different needs that they have thanks okay great and again, Bethany, uh, if you'd like to raise your hand um, to clarify or ask a follow-up question, please do so, but we'll move on to the next one. Um, now we have Madeline Glickfeld, uh, and there were a few questions asked from this attendee. So I will I ask you to unmute Madeline so that you can ask your question um, in the order that, that you'd like. So um, I'm asking you to unmute now. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Um, I just raised the issue in general of affordability and I asked a bunch of questions but they all relate to my concern. I think what you're doing is lowering the weight of affordability because you don't have the data you would like to rely on. And I'm wondering whether at the same time you have a um, you have a, a plan and a strategy other than hoping that people volunteer their rates to get that information. The work I'm doing in LA County, we had to look at the websites of every single uh, provider. If they had a website, I realized that the smaller systems don't, uh, but it's really important. Most of the systems that are doing poorly are doing poorly because their rates are too low. Um, but if they spend a whole lot of money and they have to pay for that, the rates become higher. So, and if they go to a higher rate system as a solution, then their rates might be unaffordable. So how are you planning to address that issue? 
that's basically my and how it and what point do you think you will be able to equally weight affordability with the other two care uh, characteristics because it's, it's fine to re, to find to provide affordable reliable uh, uh, excuse me a fine to provide high quality reliable water but if people can't um, they can't they can't afford to buy it then that's a, a sort of defeat uh, self-defeating. Madeline, really appreciate your feedback on this. And we, we agree with you. I mean, we want to, um, we definitely want to improve the, the risk indicators and the assessments and the data behind uh, the affordability category. Like I mentioned earlier, um, in the previous iterations of the electronic annual report, our questions related to water rates and customer charges was not mandatory. Um, we've been working this year with our electronic annual report input forum to suggest some pretty significant modifications to that section of the electronic annual report to both improve data quality, but also to make a lot of those questions mandatory for the 2020 electronic annual report. So we are anticipating for next year um, that we'll have much more data for water systems and better quality data for water systems. Um, between the last webinar and today, um, I have had staff reach out to a lot of our water systems that we're analyzing for the risk assessment to ask them to provide their water rates data or to confirm what they supplied to us in the last EAR, because sometimes systems were providing us data that was um, very wrong. <laughs> Some folks gave us their annual charges rather than their monthly. So when you looked at it, it was way too high. And in some cases it was way too low. So we, we did a lot of outreach over the last few weeks to even just try to uh, improve the data set for this year. Um, but we are hoping that with our changes next year um, to the EAR that we'll have much, much better data um, for the, the risk indicators that we would like to use next year. I also want to point out, and, and you might have seen in the white paper and my slides and throughout the other webinars that we posted, you know, we do have a number of affordability risk indicators that we would like to use, but we want to, we want to work with the public to uh, to set what the appropriate affordability thresholds should be for those indicators. These are metrics that um, have been proposed by many other stakeholders within the water sector, but the, the act of setting a threshold um, has really not um, happened <laughs> nationally uh, for a lot of these metrics. And, and we would feel more comfortable working um, much more closely with stakeholders and water systems and setting those thresholds and trying to de determine something internally within a very short period of time. Um, so we hope that you engage with us there. Um, I also want to point out, you know, we do have the proposed risk indicators in the affordability bucket um, that we're, we're going to, you know, develop further over the next year. But we are adding some additional questions to this EAR, the 2020 Electronic Annual Report, around um, finance, water system um, uh, financial capacity so that we can add additional TMS indicators in the future. Um, if you recall during our, our previous efforts a few months ago to identify risk indicators, we had, I think we had over 40 recommended indicators in the TMS category and a good chunk of those were financial, but we just didn't have the data for those, we didn't collect them in any form. And we don't have the staff capacity, Madeline, like you suggested, to go and, and, and reach out to 2,800 systems annually to try to collect this data. Um, so we are updating EAR to try to collect some new data points so that we can incorporate some of those recommended indicators into our future versions of the risk assessment. So um, again, stay tuned. And if you're interested in learning more about some of the new data collection efforts for the 2020 EAR, just email us and we can share you some material. But Madeline, I hope that answers your question. Let us know if you have any follow-up. You gave a really excellent answer. I really appreciate what you're doing. It helps a lot. Awesome. Okay, great. 
Thanks, Kristen. Uh, so we'll move on to um, Stacy Taylor's question. And so I see you're raising your hand um, and I'm asking you to unmute now. Great, thank you so much. Good morning and thank you for your presentation. Um, yeah, my question just has to do with affordability and um, this question has been raised before by myself and others uh, uh, as part of uh, several different work groups with several water industry coalitions statewide. And that has to do with taking into account the full true cost of water and not just looking at the rate as uh, a one um, indicator of affordability. Um, we all know that the water bill has a fixed cost, which is the water meter charge, plus the variable cost, which is the rate charged per unit of water. So it, at the very least, um, we should be considering the full true cost of water when we are trying to figure out an affordability, uh, you know, the cost of the true cost of water for an affordability metric. And then there is on the property tax bill, um, there are property taxes and special assessments, which are also costs that are paid to the water system by property owners, including homeowners and housing providers who pass that cost along to their renters. So that was the gist of my question is, you know, are we going to look at, at some point, the full true cost of water in uh, trying to figure out whether the, you know, water affordable is affordable for those residents? That's my question. And it's a fantastic question, Stacey, and I really appreciate it. Um, I do encourage you to take a look um, at the appendix <coughs> in the white paper, Appendix B, at some of the, the affordability indicators that rely on, on customer charges. Um, we try to use existing data right now in the EAR around the rate structure and extra charges. We do have a question about that, and we combine those to get to try to get to that, at least for this EAR, um, or I'm sorry, for this risk assessment. Um, for next year, for the 2020 EAR, um, we are breaking out uh, an income section, which is brand new. And the income section does ask for intergovernmental transfers of funds uh, to the water system. And that would capture, uh, ideally, uh, income or that's brought in by tax revenue or other charges to customers that are outside of the water system that are used to support the water utility. And then what we do is we are proposing dividing that by the, the service population and adding that as a approximation of what that additional charge might be to customer charges. So we are trying to get to that, um, Stacey, and we really appreciate your continued um, feedback on this. And we'd love your, your thoughts on our approach there for the 2020 EAR um, and how we would be incorporating that into the risk assessment and the affordability assessment. Um, it's really hard to capture that data point, um, but we are trying to take some steps to do that. So hopefully that helps. And again, we can follow up after this to, to really walk through what we're doing there if you're, if you're interested. Great, and, and this is This is Greg from UCLA. I should have said that the first time I talked. Um, I'm working under contract with the water board, but it doesn't, what you're seeing here does include the fixed charge. I do want to clarify that if it's reported, but the system includes both the fixed and variable charges. It doesn't include, you know, other sorts of fees and taxes that, may, right. as Kristen noted, but it does include the fixed charge and that, yes, that would make a huge difference if it didn't include the fixed charge. Um, but the extent that systems reported it, that's what you're seeing here. All right, Stacy, I see you have your hand raised again. Um, did you have a follow up or? Nope. Okay. I see you just lowered your hand. All right. Next, we have a question from Jonathan Rash. Um, and please feel free to raise your hand to um, expand on this question as well, because I have a feeling it was due to um, uh, an item that was brought up in the presentation. But Jonathan's question is, do I see human right to water systems that score zero? How is that possible? So thanks, Jonathan. Um, so 
I'm thinking back, I, I really don't think we have a human right to water system that would score zero since um, having one occurrence on the human right to water list would give you a, a point above zero. Um, so, but you could still have water systems on the human right to water list who are scoring relatively low across all of our categories. Um, and I think what that may indicate is you could have a system that has um, that's had a blip. It's had, you know, it has had an exceedance above an MCL, but perhaps that's not characteristic of that system. And once they come back into compliance, that system is not not at risk. Um, and I think we do have systems that kind of fit that that um, that profile. But you can see from how all of the other human right to water systems are performing across all of their all, all of our other indicators, um, they could come off the human right to water list but they're probably gonna sit on that at-risk list until they can make additional um, adjustments uh, and, and no longer meet those at-risk criteria. But Jonathan, was there anything else you wanted to add to your, your question or comment here? Well, let me just add, I'm, I'm looking at the, the data and there are no human right to water systems that do score zero, but yeah. as Kristen noted, there are some that you know, do score below um, so scoring could also be potentially at risk and at risk. All right. Jonathan, I did. Vanessa, ask, let's move on. I did ask you, Jonathan, to unmute. Um, so if you'd like to expand, um, please go ahead and you raise your hand and we'll get back to you. Um, so, yes, the next question is from Julie Ekstrom. And uh, I will also ask you to unmute yourself uh, because the question is, what is the x-axis in these charts? And that's from Julie with DWR. And hi, Julie. Um, I'm not sure if you're able to unmute yourself, but um, great question. And I should have slowed down to explain that. The x-axis on our charts were unique water systems. So, it's all, you know, they're all individual columns explaining kind of how individual systems are performing um, across the different uh, categories and the aggregated assessment that we, we're not going to list all the systems at the bottom. Um, it's showing kind of in general performance. So hopefully that helps. And the Y axis was point, uh, the scores added up. Okay. I'm not seeing that she's unmuting herself, so we can move on. Um, our next question is from Stephanie Hearn. Uh, can you confirm that weighting the risk resulted in a higher number of systems being at risk? Since we only got a quick glance at the charts, it would be helpful to hear your inter interpretation of the data. A uh, great question. So. I want to remind folks, um, so when we are looking at the data and the distributions, uh, we're doing it without any particular threshold in mind. Um, when we were looking at different weights for the either the individual indicators or the, the, the categories, um, looking at what our proposed threshold at the end is just based on, you know, the approach that we recommended, which was option three. Um, that's why when we looked at the individual categories, you know, we weren't we weren't putting the scales at the same space. It doesn't matter if you're kind of high or low. We wanted it really matters with the distribution of systems and where our systems that are we know are are failing right now, how they are uh, performing based on those weights. So because we don't have a pre, we did not have, as we developed the methodology, a predetermined threshold in mind. Um, that wasn't, uh, we weren't using that to say this many systems are below or under um, for all of the different options. So I hope that makes sense. If not, please go ahead and, um, you know, raise your hand or, or follow up with another question in the, the Q&A box. Thanks, Kristen. So now we have Hasna Khan. Um, go ahead, you are next. Hi, I'm Hasna, and my question is kind of different. It's not to following exactly the 
uh, white paper that we have, but um, it's regarding the resiliency in preparation for the power shutoff. By any chance, is there any way to bring that into a risk uh, uh, assessment uh, framework? Are you considering that since uh, obviously this is nothing under control for the systems, especially the smaller systems, and we are trying to take data on that. And uh, there is definitely a lot of events that is going through where the large utilities will cut them off and therefore there is some risk in service provi providing service. Can you comment on that a bit, please? Yeah, Hasma, thank you. Another good uh, recommendation. I, I do recall when we were looking at potential risk indicators, um, having access to backup power supply was, was one of those that was recommended, but we just don't have good data quality there. Um, but that is something that we could look at for potentially adding to an, a future version of our electronic annual report. So a good question. Um, and I think, you know, the way you framed it to um, resiliency to power shutoff is could even be broader than just whether whether or not a system has a backup mm -hmm. power supply. So I, it's a good way of framing it, and I appreciate that recommendation. We'll make sure that it's added to the list because again, we do anticipate doing um, additional data collection uh, over time so we can improve the risk indicators in the in the risk assessment. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, um, I'm just doing a time check. Uh, we have about 12 minutes left. Uh, we only have about two participants in the queue. So I encourage you to uh, get in uh, some last question and comments um, before our 11 a.m. mark. So next, um, oops, I apologize. I just lost <laughs> the comment, one second. Okay, we have Cindy Tuck uh, commenting, thanks for having this webinar. The majority of participants have not had a chance yet to review the new draft white paper, which, propose, rep, which proposes many new details. The feedback period overlaps with feedback period for the cost methodology paper and the holidays. Is it possible to extend the period somewhat and make sure the feedback is really considered? Thanks for considering. Another great question, Cindy, really appreciate it. Um, I, I wish, I, I really, really wish that we could extend uh, the feedback period longer. We do recognize it overlaps with holidays and the cost assessment methodology feedback period. Um, you know, unfortunately, because of the timing of our contract with UCLA and with uh, the, the deadlines needed for uh, getting the fund expenditure plan draft out, we need to have a final risk assessment methodology completed um, and finalized early next year. Um, we have to then, the reason the timing is so tight is because we need the results of the risk assessment in order to feed that into our cost assessment methodology so that we can get our cost estimate results and do the gap analysis uh, before the, fun, you know, before we publish the fund expenditure plan that relies on this analysis. Um, so we are under the crunch, under um, quite a crunch deadline. So we, we do have to meet these dates and we can't extend it any further. We were, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how much time we could, we could work into this. And, and unfortunately, this is the max amount of time that we can provide until January 6th. But there is, to answer your second question, you know, will we actually be considering feedback? And absolutely, yes, we consider feedback that we get every step of this process, which is why it's so important for you all to, um, to let us know what your thoughts are on our recommendations, or if you have any recommendations yourself that we should be considering to email us at our safer at waterboards.ca.gov email address. You can use the form link that we've provided during this webinar. Um, or just, you know, shoot us an email if you know us. We appreciate any feedback you can provide. Cindy, this is Michelle Frederick as well. I also just wanted to point out that this is an iterative process. So, um, you know, even if we aren't able to incorporate some comments in this year's version, 
Um, we can always incorporate things in next year as well. So, um, you know, I just, if, if there are things that go beyond this year, um, just be sure to know that we, we would incorporate it as this is moving forward as well. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Um, okay, we now have Madeline Glickfield. Uh, the last comment was when you present the lower weight for affordability, you might want to say that this is because of lack of data and that need to improve the indicator. I think that my, uh, my alarm was because I didn't understand that this was a temporary lower weight. And I will ask you to unmute yourself because um, you know you indicated you might, might want to speak. So go ahead, Madeline. I think that my, actually, I, did, I didn't mean to indicate that I wanted to speak. I think I got my fair, more than my fair time. I think it's pretty, I think it's important that people understand why that, that you're moving toward uh, more equal data for affordability. And it's really a complicated issue if you're going to do, look at the actual ability of the customers to afford the rates um, and how that rates to their housing burden and things like that. So I think that it makes sense for this to take a little bit, take longer than um, than others than than the other questions because we have better you have better data on it, and uh, so I think if you just tag that and make sure that you make the the public know that that's what you're doing, it will help a lot. Thank you. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely work on our communication there. Vanessa, let's, let's address the last question and then I want to um, just finish up with a, a few remaining slides, okay? Sure. So this one's from Anne Sturdivant. Is there a plan to address the risk from seismic activity and the need for retrofitting of outdated infrastructure in water systems? Another a great question, Anne. Um, I believe uh, proximity to uh, uh, earthquake faults was one of our proposed risk indicators, um, but based on uh, feedback from you know stakeholders and an internal survey of, um, of I think more than 60 district engineers, it was not as high of a, a, of a priority or critical um, indicator when compared to some of our other indicators in the accessibility bucket. Um, however, I do think that resiliency of water systems as they relate to any type of natural disaster is in something important for us to consider. And we're going to continue to look at data availability and quality there and, and figure out how we may incorporate um, data points like those into our, our risk assessment in the future. Um, I think the second part of your question, although maybe not intended uh, specifically to this, but I think when we talk about, you know, infrastructure replacement, um, age of assets, uh, you know, that's other, um, I think that's another interesting data point too that we'd potentially love to look at in the future if we could ever get data on it around kind of asset management related type questions. Um, so really great ideas. I, I encourage people to continue to engage with us over the years as we continue to work at how we can improve data collection and incorporate better data points into the risk assessment. Um, with that, um, again, I'm going to move things back to the PowerPoint um, and try to get to some of these remaining slides. Um, for immediate next steps, like I mentioned earlier, we're looking for feedback by January 6th on our recommendations that we've made here today um, and in our, our white paper. Um, and we're providing hyperlinks and everything here. We're going to try to get these PowerPoint slides posted online as soon as possible. We have to make them um, accessible. Uh, we're going to finalize our risk assessment and then perform the risk assessment for the 2021-22 fund expenditure plan. Um, we do uh, plan on releasing a final white paper that details what the exact risk 2.0 um, risk assessment 2.0 methodology will be. Um, we anticipate that we're going to be making some changes based on feedback that we receive. So we want to make sure that that final methodology is put out there and available for people to reference. And then the results of the risk assessment, which will be a list of systems that meet that at-risk 
threshold will be published in uh, the draft fund expenditure plan, which will be put out um, in probably the spring of next year. So stay tuned for that. Um, we are on track with our timeline, which was very aggressive. And again, I really want to appreciate everyone who has participated in our workshops um, since April on trying to develop a, a new risk assessment uh, for the fund expenditure plan. Um, for upcoming uh, events, here is our timeline. Again, January is our due date. We are conducting the risk assessment, the cost assessment, and the affordability assessment. Um, in February, we are going to publish an updated white paper for the risk assessment methodology. Um, we're also going to be hosting a cost assessment webinar on the 26th. That we're trying to, we, if we have results we can share, we might be able to share some early results from the cost estimate model. Um, but we really want to provide an in-depth overview of the methodology we'll be using to conduct the gap analysis for the cost assessment. And again, we're hoping to have things published uh, in the spring of, of next year. But I, I want to emphasize, and Michelle brought this up, um, that our risk assessment methodology is, is never really final. Um, we are going to continue to iterate. We're going to continue to improve it, especially as we refine our data collection. We improve data quality when we have um, the time to really dig in and conduct some extensive studies and, and historical data analysis to help us improve how we set threshold scores and weights for all of our indicators. Um, you know, it's it's never ending. <laughs> Just, I want to put that out there. This is not final. It's it's, it's going to continue to change and evolve over time. Um, I I really want to you know before we we round things out in the last minute, I really want to thank all of the people who have helped us get to this point. And in particular, there needs to be a huge shout out to our partners over at UCLA. Um, Greg and his team, especially Kelly and Peter, have worked tremendously hard over the last few weeks to help us collect the data that was needed for all of these indicators and to do the analysis that was needed to get us to this point. I, I can't tell you, it was a tremendous, tremendous amount of work. Um, a lot of people within the water board, including all of my staff, um, and we have an internal work group, executive management, a ton of people helped us uh, refine our data, help us with examining the analysis that was done to get us to these recommendations. So thank you. And last but not least, thank you to everyone who has joined us today and who has continued to provide feedback and comments on our methodology for our risk assessment. Um, those who have been providing extensive recommendation letters um, and who have followed up with us, really your advice your comments have been invaluable as we have developed this methodology. I want to continue to support your engagement. So please don't ever hesitate to reach out um, with any comments or questions. And for all of you here, please, please, please email us at safer at waterboards.ca.gov um, or use the forms link to provide any recommendations on, this, on the um, material we presented today. And that's in our white paper. Vanessa, do you want to close things out? Uh, thanks, Kristen. You did a great job of, of that. And I just want to say again, thanks to do you and the team for the updates and presentations. And most importantly, thank you all the attendees and participants for all your great questions and comments and for um, having a really great discussion today. So um, again, if you have any questions, please email safer at waterboards.ca.gov. And with that, we'll close out. Happy holidays and see you next time.